Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 242 of Category 5 Technology TV for Tuesday, May the, uh, what is it, the 8th? May 8th. 2012. Hey, nice to Did see you. sleep through a couple? What yeah, happened? is it 242 We're already? 242 <laughs> in the afternoon? Is that what time you got up? Man. Hey, I'll get you to, right off the top, this is Eric Kidd, by the way, folks. Hi. Eric Kidd joining us live, and uh, I'll get you to tell us what's coming up in the news. we got lots to cram well, into the show. Here's what's right? happening in the newsroom. Mm-mm. China has launched two more Baidu navigation satellites. Microsoft has pushed out a fix for a serious Hotmail password bug. The Pirate Bay must be blocked by UK ISPs. Ouch. Whoa. I have some friends who may not be happy with that. A descriptive camera has been developed by a student at NYU. And Google has received approval to start driving self-controlled cars in Nevada. Stick around. These stories are coming up later in the show. Your friends, of course, distributing perfectly legal wares. Of course. Of course. course. Hey, Eric, could you put this on for me? No, that that was yesterday. Just kind of put that on. You know, today's today's the day. Wow! I hope you have a limiter on that system. (laughs) Happy birthday, buddy. Jeez, thanks. It's <laughs> <laughs> you know what's really good the is... heck is in that cup? You, what have you been drinking? What's What's awesome is that uh, the candles... I actually have uh, a two and a five from my 25th birthday because it was fairly recently. Oh. So we can use those backwards. You have 25? Yeah, we can just yeah, kind of... nice. Just because, you know, it was fairly recently that I that I needed those. So. Oh, perfect. Gosh. Happy birthday, buddy. I can't work under these conditions. Yeah. Oh, I mean... Thank you very much. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. Nice to see you joining us in the chat room. Nice to have you here. If you're watching live, love having you here. Make sure you interact with us. Get onto our website, category5.tv. Click on interact. You'll find the chat room. You'll find ways to uh, communicate with the rest of the community. <clears throat> our ears are ringing. Yeah. My ears are really ringing. It's it's a very small studio. It's like uh, sit, in, sit in a bathroom, like a closet-sized bathroom, and... and Blow an air horn. <laughs> That's what it's What kind of... What were you blowing? Never mind. Okay. Hey, by the way, Category 5 TV is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. There if it's are. tech, it's here. Send in your postcards. We love to receive your viewer postcards here at Category 5 Technology TV. Get one from the store. Preferably one that uh, represents something that means something to you. Maybe a nearby landmark or uh, your town itself. Send it. uh, Oh, and also we get a lot of custom ones. We love receiving those as well. Category 5 Technology TV, Postal Box 29009, Barrie, Ontario, Canada, L4N7W7. Yes, what he said. (laughs) Thanks for your input, friend. I'm just trying to help. I'm just happy to be here, glad to be alive. And even if I am 25. Well, oh. We might have to reverse the numbers. Okay. Okay. Even if somebody I am on 52. Facebook saw that and said, "Yeah, I saw something." <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure he's not twenty-one? <laughs> you work it out. All right. You got a mobile device? Scan that code. M. Cat Five. TV. It's going to bring up our mobile website. You can watch on-demand episodes of Category Five Technology TV. You can read what's going on in the newsroom. All that kind of fun, crazy stuff, optimized specifically. For your mobile device. So what do each of those little marks on the QR code mean, Robbie? Could you explain that to us all? Three, seven, four, eight, nine, six. <laughs> on, off. One, zero, one, zero. Okay. <laughs> what else have we got tonight? Uh, tonight we are... Oh, I'm so excited. It's been in development for a long time. GIMP. 2.8. That's the GNU image manipulation program. Kind of like the open source alternative to Adobe Photoshop. So if you're interested in graphic manipulation, even in the slightest, if you want to be able to touch up your photos, if yeah. you want to be able to take it one step further and do some really cool effects, 
Even, Even the old version had some pretty darn cool effects. The old version was exceptional. 2.8 takes it into a, uh, pardon me, a, a much more competitive realm. I think yeah. it, we're we're really getting close to that commercial grade application with 2.8. Of course, working toward their 2.10 release. So, uh, so stick around. We're going to be talking all about the GIMP 2.8. Also, we've got viewer questions. Eric is standing by. He's got your emails at live at category 5tv That's right. Got the chat room up there. Pretty well organized tonight. I'm, like I said, I'm just happy you to like, be here. Glad to be live. Yeah, I have coffee like, in my Ubuntu mug. This is heavily caffeinated coffee tonight, folks. Because <gasps> last time he complained that it was half calf, as you may recall. It was half calf. It was half. How's that? It was half not calf as well. This this one scares me because the coffee maker kind of stopped brewing at six or eight cups. You know so, that happened to me earlier. But I put my, in enough grounds like, for twelve cups. Sorry. Yeah, I did the same thing this <laughs> afternoon. I put in enough grounds for six cups, and my daughter brought me a coffee, and she'd only put in enough water for three cups. It was, it was great. <laughs> That's all right. Sometimes that works in your favor. Monday, so yesterday, I got into work. <laughs> you, you may have seen it on Twitter. I saw that you yeah. tweet. I mean, your, I saw your tweet. But I made the coffee as strong as you normally would, and the coffee maker, like, erupted. But I was not in the kitchen at the time, so there was about this much water in the bottom of the pot. Okay. And the rest of it didn't come through, so it was extreme. It was like molasses strong. The Mount Etna of coffee makers. Yeah, it kind of went. So, fortunately, we got a new coffee maker for today. It's working great, but uh, that's not the way to start a Monday. Did Brett yell at you? (laughs) (laughs) Wasn't my fault. Not this time. Not this time. Hey, we have some questions. Should we jump into some questions, we're or what do you jump, want to? Oh, we're, we're not jumping yet. I can tell. I can tell leaping. by the look in your face. I've got well, I've got lots of people in the chat room. I want to say hi to. But first, we're going to take a real quick break and uh, don't go anywhere. We're going to talk about your. View, we're going to bring up your viewer questions right after the break. Uh, also, want to say hi to you in the chat room, and uh, we're going to be looking at the GIMP 2.8. So stick around. We'll be right back. At EcoAlkalines, we believe you should be able to trust your batteries not just here, but here, here, and here. But with one exception, you should also be able to trust your batteries here. EcoAlkalines are the world's first and only certified carbon neutral battery manufactured to the highest standards of recycling and quality, without any trace amounts of harmful chemicals like mercury, lead, or cadmium. EcoAlkalines provide performance that rivals leading national alkaline battery brands at a comparable price. Find out more about the EcoAlkalines difference. EcoAlkalines.com This is Category 5 Technology TV. We're online, www.category5.tv. Eric J.A. Farm was saying in the chat room that you look like you're about to fall asleep. Sleep? What's up? <laughs> Lots of happy birthdays. You're going to have to look over the chat logs. Folks, nice to see you. A. Jameson, DJ Hot Wheels. Uh, Garby, always a pleasure. We got Chris <laughs> Reich who's joined us. All right. Sir, I just saw something good to see you. I hope you're well. about Eric being an old man. Come on now. You gotta admit, for an old man, he's doing pretty good. Wow! <laughs> you know, he exudes youthfulness. I'm just is that not even gonna ask good guy what he's on about. Um. <laughs> Raven Lords, hey Agamotto, <laughs> Toby. It's Toby, by the way. He told me to to tell you who Toby T zero B B. Oh, Toby three three one. <laughs> the three three three. <laughs> to be. I said in the chat room, well, Eric doesn't speak late, so. <laughs> yeah, Eric hardly speaks come English. Come on, Toby. He's fifty-two. Come on, man. Hey, he's never. He's. He's. It's going to take him a while to get there. <laughs> oh, fantastic, <sighs> okay. Toby. Uh, Toby was uh, in the chat room this week, and a uh, pleasure to see and you. What there. was he doing in there? I think he was procrastinating. Supposed to be doing some work or something. Oh. procrastination is a terrible thing. Well, this is the earliest I've ever been late. <laughs> 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 oh, oh dear me okay straight to the viewer questions invincible i'm not reading Pyros any questions Rock. no nice to see us yeah and uh thank you for all the birthday greetings out there that's kind of nice something nice. is uh girlfriend made me breakfast and really yesterday and she's a keeper she definitely is yeah. and and a cinnamon coffee cake with candles jammed in it and 
good. That's good. the way my days. Oh, and fresh coffee and fresh juice. It was great. And then wow. my, all my kids took me up to the to the keg last night. Wonderful. So yeah. you, ha- you had steak. Yeah, I had. Actually, I had roast beef. You had roast beef I had at the roast keg. Beef. I did. How was it? Fabulous. Th- that that to me, I, if I were to go to the keg, I would be like, give me a steak. No, oh, I thought roast beef was their thing, and steaks were a sideline. Oh, yeah. Really? No, I don't know. It was very good. It was wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. I'm sure it was just fantastic. And my kids paid for it, so it seemed <laughs> better. Really good. Really good. Should have got the, the roast beef I and the steak. I was gonna. Actually, you know what? The difference between the 10-ounce and the 12-ounce? Yeah. 10 ounces is way more than you need. <laughs> True enough. And, and 12 ounces was way, way more. Than, I got through it all, though. Wow. <laughs> Good job. Anyway, here's a question from Sydney all Joyner. All right. Hey, Sydney. Who's running Debian 6 and Ubuntu 10.04. Intel is in the third generation of their current line of processors. Mm-hmm. When will the Linux community catch up and be able to take advantage of this technology? Whoa. What do you mean? I'll repeat the question. When will the Linux community catch up and be able to take advantage of this technology? What do I need to do to take advantage of this, Sydney? Go ahead and buy one. Uh, actually, Sandy Bridge was, was kind of where things kind of fell apart a little bit with the kernel, but Ivy Bridge, the newest Intel processors, are apparently performing very, very well, uh, including the onboard graphics, which is, you know, that's that was kind of where the problem lied with, with the Sandy Bridge. So... With Ivy Bridge, though, I think uh, things are working very, very nice with Linux. So, hey, if you've got a specific p- issue with the Ivy Bridge chipset and uh, and Linux, let us know. So don't be harassing our viewers. Yeah. You're telling them this question's not uh, specific enough. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry, Sydney. I, I I am under the understanding he's that he's in a bad I, mood today. Terrible. <laughs> you know, I haven't even finished my cup of coffee. Eric was five minutes early. Yeah. What am I going to do? No, well, Sydney, I, I've, I'm under the impression, and, and we can, you know, we can look, but I'm pretty sure that Ivy Bridge is working real well. That's the new processors from... If, uh, Fairnex has got an article here, first one that came up in Google. Uh, what do they say? Oh, this is too early. This is before it was released, I think. That was May 6, 2012. Oh, was it? T- <laughs> I'm just skimming. It's you too know, much text. You know, and it's finding too much the text. details of the article. Just, he it's can't too much. read it's the too date. Mu- All these ads are just confusing to me right now, okay? It's too much flashiness. Oh. Um, the driver's still at OpenGL 3.0. All right. I, I don't know. Windows driver is going to OpenGL 4. Okay, I I don't know. I I don't have one, but but I am under the understanding that they're performing very very well. Sydney, don't challenge them. <laughs> of course, you're you're only going to get OpenGL version three just now. Is that what you mean? As far as three D performance on the chipset, hard to say. But you know what? Linux is. I don't know how to say, but it's like constantly development and bleeding edge stuff. And there's always stuff that's that's being tested that uh, that is going to be you know tomorrow's most awesome technology, and we're seeing that with with Ubuntu right now with 12.04. It's like they're they're at that bleeding edge, and so we're really seeing a push toward newer technologies. Which leads into our next question. Oh, <laughs> all right. Hey, thanks for the for the question, Sydney. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't I don't have one to test with. I am under the impression that they're performing very well. I see that they're only supporting. Uh, GL3 right now instead of GL4, uh, as as is the case on the Windows platform. Only really going to affect gaming, like hardcore gaming, if you have OpenGL4 requiring games on Linux. That would be the other thing. So, so we'll, we'll see. see. Well, John Crisp has a question. John, and John is running yeah. Win7 64 Mint 12 Virtual Box Ubuntu 11.10. 12.04, which leads oh, okay. to your comment. Yeah. So, hi, Robbie and crew. I guess I'm hey, crew, crew today. Mm. Not too pleased with Ubuntu 12.04. Mm. No sound. 
It seems lots of people are having this issue. It no worked way. fine and does in Mint 12 and Ubuntu 11.10. I've tried all the tricks found on various forums. Nothing seems to work. Suggestions welcomed. And that's from John down in the Lone Star State, down in Dallas. All right, John. Haven't had that problem. Lone what what chipset are you using? And Bob Will's music. Has anyone in the chat room seen that happen? Installed 12.04, clean install, and uh, things aren't working as far as sound goes. John, um, I haven't come across that. Chat room hasn't come across that. I wonder if it's something specific to your to your chipset. Is it a is it a <coughs> legacy kind of system? Are you using some older hardware by any chance? And I only ask that because there is a real push right now for. It's not. It's not like the Windows push where you know Windows Seven came out and you had to buy a new computer, plain and simple. Uh, but Linux is being pushed in the direction of let's kind of let's kind of let the legacy stuff drop off because it's bloat at this point. Why are we supporting audio cards or graphics cards that were popular back in the eighties and nineties? So there comes a point where they say, okay, well this is this is bloating the CD. We're just going to leave that kind of stuff off. So, th- so that's why I ask if you've got. Any legacy stuff that could be the problem. Old computer, old audio card, especially. That would be my first question. Wow, you trashed the last guy's question. Now you're trashing this guy's no. computer. No, I'm he's, not. He's in a bad mood. I'm just trying to help, man. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to rue the day you asked me to come in on a Tuesday night, aren't you? <laughs> Uh, oh, I, John, I I don't have an answer for you, but I think my best answer would be to uh, get a hold of the Ubuntu community, get into the forum, become a part of those com- those conversations. It's not ideal, right? Because you need to have sound. Um, I don't I don't know enough about your system, and it looks like um, he's not in the chat room. From what I can what tell, what is wary puppy? Good guy. No idea. Because good guy suggesting you run it. <laughs> <laughs> my my thinking is that okay if, you, if and and Toby was mentioning okay well I'm afraid now to to upgrade to twelve point oh four from okay. ten point oh four because what if my audio stops working because my computer's pretty old. <laughs> oh, it's a version of Puppy Linux for older machines. There you go. I kind of had a feeling that it okay. might be. <laughs> so with Toby's comment, what I would say is Toby, get the ISO. All right. Which is the file, the the CD off of the website Ubuntu.com. Uh, don't go through like a, a Wubi install or anything like we demonstrated the other week. That was just to, to introduce Linux to, to Windows users. But for you, get the ISO, boot up from the CD, run it in live mode. It's going to be slow as death because it's running off of a CD. A slow and painful death? A very slow, painful death because it's running off of a CD, right? So don't don't think that's how it's going to perform because once you put it on your hard drive at three gigabits a second, versus your CD at like one megabit a second, you're going to notice a performance gain. <laughs> but the thing is, is that then you can test your networking, test your Wi-Fi if you're using Wi-Fi. I don't I don't really use Wi-Fi on my computers because it's pointless and useless. Um, but test your audio, right? Get onto a website like Category 5, good example, because you can bring up a player window. It's going to test flash, it's going to test uh, audio, video performance, all that stuff out of the can through the live CD. So YouTube is another example where you can go to their website, click on a video, you're going to hear it, you're going to see it, you're going to be able to see if it works. And then if you're confident in the operating system and the distribution, then feel free to do the upgrade. But if you're really scared, Eric and I have said it before, Get a hold of Clonezilla. Make an image of your actual hard drive, a clone of your hard drive. That way, you know, 15 minutes after you're you're done installing, if you find, oh no, it's broken everything, you can revert right back to the exact place you were before you uh, you installed 1204. All right. But as far as John goes, uh, John, I'm sorry, man, I don't have an answer for you, but Ubuntu forums is probably going to be the place for you. Get a hold of our community at forum dot category five dot tv as well maybe there's somebody in there but of course ubuntu uh, is going to have the forum that is you know very it's people who are talking about the new disc the new distro so that's going to be probably the best 
best spot for you. Of course, comments in the chat room, Agamotto saying, well, make sure it's not muted, uh, things like that. That, that goes without saying, really. Um, but definitely, you know, make sure that, you know, you bring up your volume control. Make sure that everything's up. Try different applications. Ubuntu 1204 is going to work with your sound card a little bit differently because each application has its own volume control. So you can have your movie playing at a very low volume, but then have your Skype at full volume, for example, so that you can hear a conversation but be watching a movie while you're talking to mom. <laughs> so that's a little different. Oh, check the stupid stuff first. Thanks, Chris Rick. Chris Reich's suggestion. <laughs> Could be the grapple grommet. The thingamajig over there is not even plugged in. You know that green thing? That cable there? Plug yeah. it in. Because you tripped over it last week. Last Tuesday when you was getting in the back. You done? Yeah, I'm done. We have another question. I'm waiting for you to interrupt me. You know? This is from Old <laughs> Guy Jim. Geez, I wonder if he's 52 yet. Old Guy Jim? Okay. Uh, he's only 49, you know? So, man. <laughs> you know, it's funny. 52 doesn't It's amazing feel... how I can compliment Jim and insult you all in one fell swoop. 52 doesn't feel all that different no, from 51, know. you know? It's amazing because, um, like, as time goes on, I think we're all kids at heart, plain and simple. And let's keep it that way, right? <sighs> Sadly, when I get banged up at hockey, the doctor looks me square in the eye and says, Eric, you're you not got, 18. You've got yeah. to stop this. This is from Old Guy Jim, however old <laughs> Guy Jim is. Old Guy Jim. Guy Jim. Jim. No, that's Hey, not. Jim. Also We're running Ubuntu 12.04. Oh, 12. right. Excellent. <laughs> Made the switch. <laughs> old Guy Jim says 52 is a long time ago. Okay. Just like that. Anyway, Old Guy Jim's running 12.04. Robbie F., this is more to thank you for your response last Tuesday to my question about Perfect Ubuntu. Hey, yeah. I took the plunge and did a double upgrade from Ubuntu 11.04 to 12.04, thinking that it looks like Mac OS and I would just learn it. But I still don't think it is a logical front end for a desktop computer. Hmm. Fortunately, I downloaded GNOME Shell and now use the GNOME Classic front end. Much more logical. Still working hmm. on determining the differences and to make it my own. By the by, having to maximize an application in order to see the menu bar was another factor to go to the classic desktop. As usual, a big thank you for all you do with Category 5, including troubleshooting a non-functioning USB bridge. I know, we have the same trouble with the audio portion of our interactive whiteboards in our school system. I'm glad I found Category 5. Yeah, Jim. cheers. We are glad that you found us as well. <clears throat> I, I totally hear you. I mean, you didn't get the touchscreen upgrade at the same time as you got the 1204 upgrade. Because it, it still feels that way, but 1204, I think. Whoa. Excuse me. Let's try that again, Jim. Did you get any on you? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Jim. Live TV. Um, no, 1204 really s starts to feel like a desktop OS again, but it is a paradigm shift. It's a different kind of feeling. What's that? Twenty to your <laughs> to your to your operating system, to your computer interaction. But I think after some time of using it, you're going to start to get used to it, Jim. I know you've installed the GNOME kind of classic look, but I'd encourage you to tr you know play around with Unity. I'm going to show you one real quick thing, just because of one of the comments that you made, and that's you know when you have uh, an application open. You're saying that, okay, well, where are my file windows? It's, it's weird, right? Where's my file button? Where's my edit? Where, I want to paste something into terminal. I can't hit Control-V or Control-C because that's a different command altogether. If I, you know, I'm typing something here and I want to copy that, well, where's my edit for copy? Because Control-C is going to go like that. So, Jim, what you can do, I know what you're doing is you're maximizing the window, and then you've got your file and everything up here. Okay. Quick little tip for you, though. Here I am. I've got my window anywhere on the screen. I can point to the bar up here at the top, and you notice what happens as I point? I know you can't see my cursor, but I'm going to point up with my, with my mouse cursor, and you'll see that the Look file up edit... Up. Yeah. There they are. They're there. It's all about Canonicals and Ubuntu's wish to clean up the desktop, make it so that you've, you've maximized. Look at how big my terminal window is, even on this little screen. 
you've maximized that space very, very effectively. They're not wasting a lot of space with you know menus and task uh, toolbars and things like that. It's very, very clean. That's kind of what they were going so for. The toolbar stays up top. Yeah, it's always there for the active window. Size. So, like I say, here we are. There's my edit menu up here. Much more like the Mac OS. And as you say, Mac OS, right? It, Mac OS does a similar kind of thing. It's, it puts it up at the top. It's not a part of the window itself. It's up here. Very confusing for us Windows guys. Confusing when you're used to that old style interface. Yeah. Definitely. But it doesn't take you long to get used to that kind of aspect. So, Jim, don't lose hope. It's hard to teach a dinosaur a new trick. No, that was no comment on Jim's age. But <laughs> well, I think you've gotten... Uh, oh. <laughs> thinks, thinks he's too old to change. The fact is, Jim, I think... Um, change this, is good, donkey. Well, oh. it kind of is, and it's kind of refreshing. Uh, I was talking to Mark Shuttleworth this morning, and he said that's part of the, the transition uh, is, is the fact that it's refreshing to jump from 10.04 to 12.04. There's such a, a shift there. Because I didn't do the, the transition from 10.04 all, you know, to 11 point, or 10.10 and 11.04 and 11.10. I didn't do that. I went from 10.04 to 12.04. And a lot of people are doing that because that's the natural progression of the LTS cycle. So what Mark was saying is it's, it's refreshing because it's new. It's, it's intuitive once you learn your way around. I'm still learning it. I want to get to the point with Ubuntu where I can I can answer your questions more thoroughly because I you know you think that it's new to you. I'm the guy who s sits here once a week and and takes you through tutorials and stuff and does my best to 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 show you stuff and all of a sudden my whole world is turned upside down because something that I've been using for so many years with the GNOME 2 style interface is gone. So that's where my discomfort comes in. So yeah, I hear you. Well, there I you hear go. you for sure. Invincible Mutant says GNOME Shell performs better than Unity. And that's the case in <coughs> pardon me in some cases, especially if your hardware doesn't quite support the graphical elements. Um, I tend to like if I'm running a virtual machine with Ubuntu 12.04, I'll switch to 2D mode for Unity. That way, it performs a lot better for me because it's not tapping into uh, to the the GL kind of you know the the comp is effects and uh, blur functions and this and that seems to work a little better in 2D in some cases. But yeah, I hear you. Thanks, Jot. Thanks, everybody. I think that's Yacht. Yeah. Free. <laughs> Garby. Yacht, correct him, would you? <laughs> okay. We have time for another question? Yeah, let's take another okay, question. Okay, and this is Hi, Robbie, and co hosts. And they, uh, okay, hold up. But we're getting a lot of this, eh? Hey, Robbie and people. Hey, Robbie and whoever is there. You can go to... Hey, Robbie and occupant of the other chair. Yeah. Okay. Let's bring up my computer. Computers are amazing. Cat5.tv slash calendar. Okay. Anytime you want. And I only say this because it's, it's a helpful little thing. Look, there's last week, co-host Erica Lalonde. There's this week, co-host Eric Kidd. There's next week, co-host... Hillary Rumble, the following week. Rachel Shue. It, it shows you who's going to be on. It tells you all about what's coming up on the show. I think it's a great feature. You can subscribe to it. It has iCal support. It has Google Calendar support. You can add it to your Google Calendar. It will notify you before the show starts. It'll pop you an email. Pyrus Rock is so excited that it lets them know that the show is about to begin. So... Check that out, cat5.tv slash calendar. So, hello, However, if we don't hello Robbie and Eric. And, you know... Yeah, Ron sent that <laughs> yesterday, and <laughs> we, who knows yeah, who's going to be. You on sent this your show, question this afternoon, and we've already yeah. got th thirty other questions we ahead of you. Read so it today, and then we'll we'll get to it, and yeah. it'll make a lot of sense. And then you're going to criticize them for next week for saying Hillary is not Eric. <laughs> <laughs> it's so okay. confusing. Hey, Ron, how are you? Hey, Ron. Hi, Robbie and Eric. I was able to add a second hard drive to my Zorino's system. How hmm. would you pronounce that? Zorin OS. Zorin OS. It's, the capitalization is important. It's OS is a capital oh, Now OS. you're trashing Ron's capitalization. <laughs> okay, so we've got Zorin, the operating system. <laughs> uh, 
these are the command. Um, where was I? I d- he, he was able to <laughs> add a second hard drive to his system. Excellent. Using the Zorin OS. Yes. Okay. These are the commands I used. Do you want me to read them all? Sudo fdisk dash one. Uh, it'd probably be an L for list. It'll show okay. you all your partitions. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, and then a sudo cf disk slash dev slash sdb. Okay. And then a sudo mkfs dot ext4 slash dev slash sdb1. Oh, yeah. I wonder if I should bring this one up, eh? Yeah, perhaps. This might, this might help to bring this one up on the screen. But we should uh, we should jump into the news, and then we'll come right back to that. Just because it took you so long to get through the question. I know it was my fault, Ron. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness. Oh, dear me. Eric, my friend, take it away. Careful who you're calling friend, or I mean whom. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love that he'll stop and correct himself <laughs> as well as us. Every now and then it has to happen. It has to be done. Here are the top stories from the Category 5.TV newsroom. China has moved a step closer to completing its own navigation and positioning satellite network with the launch of two more navigation satellites. It brings the Baidu system, which became operational with coverage of China last December, to 13 satellites. To have global coverage, the country eventually aims to have 35 satellites in orbit by 2020. China hopes that Baidu will wean it off the U.S. global positioning system. I didn't realize that they were piggybacking. Interesting. Well, there you go. Yeah. Microsoft rushed out a fix for a serious bug in its Hotmail webmail services recently. The bug allowed a hacker to reset the password for a Hotmail account, locking out its owner and giving the attacker access to the inbox. The fix was put together because the bug was starting to be actively exploited online. One security news site reported that some hackers were offering to hack Hotmail accounts for $20 or approximately £12. We'll, pounds. Yeah, we'll do it for 10 <laughs> Computer security researchers discovered the vulnerability in early April and told Microsoft about it soon afterwards. The bug revolved around the way Hotmail handles the data that must pass back and forth when a user wants to reset their password. Mm. <clears throat> File sharing site, the Pirate Bay, must be blocked by UK internet service providers, the High Court has ruled. The Swedish website hosts links to download hosts links to download mostly pirated free music and video sky everything everywhere talk talk o2 and virgin media must all prevent their users from accessing the site Mm -mm. that's a big move yes it is Mm. a camera which produces written descriptions of scenes rather than photographs has been invented by a student in the u.s it's a boat (laughs) it's a tree the device it's a bald-headed guy oh (laughs) Sorry. The device uploads pictures to the web, which are described within minutes by users on Amazon's Mechanical Turk service. The short description is then sent back to the camera and printed. Boy, you could have some fun with that. <laughs> this would have worked really well the week that we were looking at Tin Eye and we brought up the Queen of Hearts. You're looking like a man. <laughs> it was developed by Matt Richardson, an interactive communications graduate student at New York University. What does the camera say about Matt? Genius. <laughs> Having trouble getting your driver's license? No problem. Just get your car to take the test. No joke. Nevada has become the first state in America to allow vehicles to apply for their own driver's licenses. Car manufacturers have been working on taking human error out of driving for more than a decade with innovations such as lane departure warning, self applying brakes self-applying brakes and cars which park themselves google however has come up with the ultimate version of cruise control by removing the driver completely with the help of video cameras lasers and radar sensors it relies on mapping which is created by google's own staff who pre-drive the route filling in the location of lane markings and road signs Boy, you wouldn't want to be driving through a new subdivision (laughs) despite being controlled by a computer a driver will still need to sit in the car Google embarked on an extensive testing program of the cars and has now secured the approval of Nevada's Department of Motor Vehicles. Hmm. Well, so did, can you buy the hat for your car? I don't know. It's uh, the interface. What, what, what is the uh, the programming interface like? That's probably very futuresque. Yeah. Yeah. That would look. So you can't cool just on slap van. that on the top of your smart car, can you? That would be stupid. Or your uh, seventy-two Ford pickup. 
That would be cool. I wonder if that will allow, and this is strange if you think about it, but would that allow visually impaired persons to get around a lot easier? How about alcoholically impaired people to get around? There is that. I mean, there, it's the the cab. Honest, Oscar, I wasn't driving. The cab, the cabbie of the future, right? Yeah, they could put together a fleet of these for for taxi service, and but uh, but for visually impaired, seriously, as a as yeah. a as as a means of transportation, like somebody could buy a car. They could be legally blind. They could buy this car and be able to get around on on their own in Nevada. In Nevada, <laughs> only in Nevada. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a start, right? I think that's pretty exciting. That's pretty cool. Where the gambling and other things are legal, and yeah. Okay. Was it was it Total Recall? I think the original. I don't remember which movie, but I think it was Total Recall with the cabs. And it was the robot that was driving it, and that kind of that kind of reminds me of it. I've been in a cab with a robot before, but yeah. <laughs> Interesting. No. We're going to talk about that after. You can the get show. the full stories at category5.tv slash newsroom. The category5.tv newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions by our community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy of on-air mention, email newsroom at category5.tv. For the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Eric Kidd. We also love to receive emails that are not worthy of on-air <clears throat> mention. Yeah. Yeah. Those are great, too. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, yeah, we'll accept any. Category Five Technology TV is brought to you in part by Cordery Electric. If you see these beautiful lights that we have going, there's no flicker, there's nothing going on out of the ordinary. It works great, and that's all thanks to Cordery. Uh, you can check them out; they are the official electrical sponsor of Category Five Technology TV. CorderyElectric.com. Is Cordery running 12.04 Ubuntu? <laughs> are you? I don't. We know. could talk to them. You know, we could get them <laughs> get them to make the switch. We're also brought to you by GardenGateFarms.com. For certified organic broccoli sprout and wheatgrass juice, visit GardenGateFarms.com. All right, I know we've got a question there, so I am pulling up my email so I can kind of look through here. Okay, so this, this comes to us from Ron. Ron Smith. Ron Smith. Okay, so they basically created a, they've got a hard drive in their system. They're mounting it for the first time. Now, Using Zorin OS, I think we established that. Yeah. yeah. If you can bear with me just one second, maybe Eric can quip and, and insult. <laughs> Eric and will be quiet then. I'm, okay. uh, what I'm, <laughs> Fine. Don't have to tell me twice to shut up. What I'm one time do, I almost starved to death because I shut up for so long. No, okay, I'll stop. Well. <laughs> <sighs> oh, okay, Ron, I'm done. <laughs> I just I wanted to <laughs> copy that into a... I, I, I try to keep your private information private so i've copied that into a text file so that your email address and things like that aren't exposed okay so here we go <laughs> all right so robbie and eric i was able to add a second hard drive to my zorin os system you're going to change the capitalization <laughs> you got a jerk okay so f disk uh dash l yeah uh, we we get the idea absolutely okay so he's created a uh a partition, probably using CF disk, gone in, created the partition for on SDB, called SDB1. So there's one partition on the hard drive. Excellent. Okay. Created it as ext4. Uh, You've made a directory off of the root folder of your hard drive called data. That would be the first thing that I might change, to be honest with you. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, it's on your root folder, and it's probably... I like to put stuff in an organizational structure so that backups are a little bit easier. And I know uh, you're probably not going to back up anything in the root folder of your computer on Linux, but it, it just kind of keeps things logical. Because now, what happens if you add another hard drive? Where does that go? Data 2 in your root folder? So I like to put things in mount, MNT. So what I would do there, I would just change that to make dir slash MNT slash data. I would just keep them in there, because that's the folder that's speci you know, specifically built for data. Okay, then you ch modded the data directory to 777, which may not be necessary if you do ch own correctly. Um, you'd, you'd probably, I mean, it's, it's your own computer, so 777 is probably safe, but of course you're opening yourself up to hackers and stuff with 777, but probably okay. You'd be better to sudo ch own <coughs> dash 
are or just it, it's only a mount point at this point there's no recursion necessary so we don't need the dash r so you would go uh, ron ron if your username is ron mount data for for example so now you are the owner of that folder of that mount point but yeah you're probably right that 777 will work for you too pardon me g edit your fs tab that's your file system table added this line slash dev slash sdb1 mount point slash data which just for the sake of the demonstration i'm going to change that to mnt as well just so that it's logical to what i've suggested before ext4 is the file system using the default settings and we're not going to run scans on the drive uh, when you when you reboot your computer which i'd probably suggest just for the integrity of your drive change this to one or two probably two because you've already this is sdb so your sda is probably one by having zero at the end of the line there you're saying don't scan my drive ever don't ever do a, 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 a file system scan on my drive i would set that to two which is going to put it in order uh, one uh, actually what it's going to do i should explain that if your if your hard drive SDA is one, you don't want to set this one to one because then they're going to go in in order. So it's because it, it can only do one at a time of that number. So SDA will when you reboot your computer 30 times or whatever, your computer's going to say, okay, it's time to scan the hard drives. So any that have one at the end of the line are going to be the first to be scanned. So but they're going to be done in order. So SDA is your one. So leave it that way. It's going to get scanned. If SDB is one it's going to go through sda and then go through sdb in the scan it's going to take some time if on the other hand you've got sda is one sdb is two then it, they're going to run in parallel they're going to be multitasking uh, using the new kind of structure of the way that linux boots oh, okay. so now both hard drives will be doing a file scan at the same time cutting your time in half if they're both the same size hard drive so you want to set that up that way by having it set as zero as you do uh, it's not going to get scanned. So if you have file system problems, they're not going to get corrected, and you're not going to get notifications of those problems. So I'd probably leave that. Uh, I'd probably set that as two. Okay. Um, so you wanted to add the drive to increase storage space for existing folders. For example, download folder and VirtualBox folder under your user, your home folder. Um, both drives are 500 gig drives. There, that answers that question. Is it possible? Absolutely. Let's do it. And what, what you can do too, go to your home folder while we're at it and just check on the, do ls-all, enter, and look at, I'm gonna look at demo because that's my user. And you see my username is demo and my group is demo. So if you're Ron, you'll probably see Ron Ron and then your chown command is correct. Ron Ron, right? Mount slash whatever, okay? So that's where that comes from. And you know that because your your home folder obviously you have access to. My children have a login here, and I don't know what it's done to them. I think I've deleted that account. That's what's happened there. <laughs> tester guy is an example, one that I used for testing, and it creates the root as tester guy colon tester guy. Okay, so cd mnt as Viggle. Uh, apparently, I had a mount point that I created a random file name. An asfiggle. It's asfiggle. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Only one ass. <laughs> okay, sudo. we got to be super user do. Make dir. This is to create the mount point. All right, we're going to create this one. Is going to be. We're going to just call that sdb1. Okay. Excellent. Done. It's there. Okay. So then let's pretend that this is mounted. I've blah, 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 mounted it. And you can go mount dash A. You don't need to reboot your computer. Go sudo mount dash a after you've done setting up your fs tab and it will give it a go oh and i noticed something else about your fs tab just now i realized that i would change can we talk about blk id in a few minutes do we will we have time probably not we're going to need to look at the gimp here <clears throat> okay here's what i want to do i want to go make dir now notice i've gone pretend it's mounted here okay run and now i'm on the hard drive and i'm going to make dir I need to. I, I I don't need sudo because I've got access to it. Let's do it right now. Ch own sdb one. Uh, no, demo. Demo sdb one. Sudo. There. Okay. So now that's owned by 
my user. So now I can go into SDB1, which is what you were accomplishing with uh, with your uh, 777 ch mod, but that's unsafe. You want to set it to your user. So now, make dir video. Okay, so now I've got a folder called video on this hard drive. I can pop all my video into it. Go back to my home folder. There it is. Okay, move video to dot slash video backup. Okay. Not stat. Okay, I don't have a video folder. What do I have? Oh, videos. It's plural. Okay. What I'm doing is I'm backing it up. It's gone. Okay. Now ln s for create a sim link. We've already mounted the drive, <clears throat> so we're gonna go mnt sdb1 video space videos enter. Okay, now I've got a sim link there. If I go to my home folder, I click on videos, I create a folder in here, and I go, hello! You'll notice that my directory seems to be demo slash videos. However, if I go to my home folder, go up a couple of levels in my file system, and go into MNT SDB1 video, you'll see that the hello folder is, in fact, on my SDB1 drive. Okay? So absolutely it can be done. We're going to use a mount point. We're going to mount our hard drive to it. Uh, what I was saying is you want to use your, your UUID of the hard drive, not SDB1, okay? Go into your terminal, and I know I'm out of time here to, to be doing this for you, but I care more about, about Ron than I do about everything, because viewers, <laughs> viewers matter, all right? So let's, let's make sure that you're taking care of Sorry about the Ron. other three guys who yeah. ask questions, but Ron, <laughs> you, you are important to Robbie. Yes. Uh, well, if I, if I know the answers Sorry, and I can help guy, you, Jim. if I can seriously help you. Okay, cd slash dev Sorry, ls uh, sdb star. Okay, because I have an sdb drive, second hard drive in my computer. So now I want to go sudo blkid and then space sdb1. Done. Okay. There's my UUID for this drive. That's what I want to use in my FS tab, not SDB1. Reason for that is because SDB1 will change, your UUID will not, because it's specific to the firm to the actual. It's like a MD5 of that drive. Whereas SDB1, you stick another hard drive in there, and all of a sudden your BIOS says, "Oh, well, that's now SDC1," and now none of your mount points are working. Everything's broken. You've lost everything. Or seemingly so. You got to figure it out. Use your UID, okay? <clears throat> Gang, let's take a look at GIMP. GNU Image Manipulation Program has been released. 2.8 is the version. Very, very excited about this. Wow. If you're using Ubuntu 12.04, fantastic. I'm going to show you how to install it. If you're using anything earlier than that, you can follow the same process, but there are risks involved. You could break your system. That's my disclaimer. I'm warning you now. If you're not on 12.04, this could break your system. On the other hand, if you want to follow a different step-by-step, -step, you can go to the website gimp.org, and you can follow through a source build, which is frustrating, tough, difficult, because it's not in the repositories yet. It's only available in PPA. Okay? So in that case, if you're using an older version than 12.04, Try building from source, probably not going to work out of the box. You're going to have to know how to do that. Don't do it if you're a novice user. You're going to have to be building you know, some extra stuff in order to get that to work. On Ubuntu 12.04, there's a PPA that is available to you, and I'm going to show you how to do that. First of all, I'm just going to bring up on Ubuntu 12.04 uh, here just to show you that GIMP is not installed. If you have it installed, um, make sure you uninstall it first, okay? Because you're probably using 2.6, and I'll show you why. If you get over to uh, to the Ubuntu Software Center here, all right. Just do a quick search. We're going to search for GIMP, G-I-M-P, and again, it stands for GNU Image Manipulation Program. Click on More Info, and you see here. The version is going to be 2.6 point something. There it is, 2.6.12. Okay, so that's the one that's currently in the Ubuntu repositories. We want to get the new version, 2.8, is what we want to try. So let's bring up our terminal. And within terminal, I'm going to actually add this repository. Now keep in mind, I'm going to, I'm going to put these commands in the show notes for episode number 242. 
So we got to be super user sudo apt uh, or add apt repository, and we're going to add this PPA PPA colon, and it's auto or auto dash k e s s e l g u l a s c h slash gimp. It's going to add the PPA repository to your system, and uh, as soon as it I seems hit enter, very here, intuitive. Yeah, <coughs> it's a workaround <laughs> to the fact that it's not currently available. Uh, on Ubuntu as a pre-compiled package. Okay, this is coming. Don't be scared. This is coming to Ubuntu near you. It's just that it just came out, okay? This is a warning, just warning us what I told you already. It's going to break your system if you're using anything but 1204. Okay, so that's added the repository. Now I'm going to update my apt with sudo apt-get update. We're just going to whiz through the installation procedure just to get it onto our 1204 system. And some are saying, you know what? If you really want to go with 2.8, it's worth the upgrade to 12.04. Just make sure you uninstall any old version of GIMP. Otherwise, you're going to have conflicting packages and uh, problems with the configuration because it saves files in the same place. Okay, now we're going to bring back up uh, the Ubuntu Software Center. I'm so used to saying Synaptic Package Manager. I just about said it again. You did say it. <laughs> Almost. Oh, I did. Oh. Okay, let's do a search once again, exactly what we did before. As simple as that, as Eric says, it looks complicated. It's really not. And I'll give you copy and paste directions. Do a search for GIMP. Click on More Info again. Again, this is episode number 242. I'm going to put the instructions in the show notes for this episode on our website, category5.tv. Check out the version here, available in Ubuntu Software Center now. There we go. All right. So what I'm going to do, <clears throat> I'm going to highlight all these add-ons because <clears throat> that's that's a bonus to get all this extra stuff brushes palettes gradients a scanner plug-in uh all this other stuff there's some extra things that you can get with gimp good guy says you can install synaptic in 12.04 mm -hmm. you can i'm working out of the box here this is a brand okay. new fresh install <clears throat> thanks good guy he's a good guy fantastic guy that good guy is so good <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to apply changes. That old guy is so old. <laughs> <laughs> Enter your password. We'll be good to go. I'm going to accelerate things here just to, because we're running out of time. So we'll just kind of zip. Oh. <laughs> <sighs> I'm going to love that until it dies. All right, let's bring up the GIMP. Here yep, we go, it's done. Rob, he's working out of the box. In other words, he has no idea what's going on. <laughs> Thanks, Jot. All right, there it is. You see it's installed. We're good to go. Let's bring it up. GIMP 2.8 is ready Ooh, to go. It looks very different. Well, the splash screen does indeed mm. look different. Do they have one for Windows? No, not yet. For once, ladies and gentlemen... Linux is ahead of the game. <laughs> and he gets upset when I do something like this. No, I'm this. serious. Because <laughs> it gets really, like, you know, Skype was always notorious for, oh, they're way, they're like version 12 on Windows and version 3 in Linux. It's like, that's ridiculous. Okay, so here, GIMP is 2.8 on Linux. And it's coming to Windows and Mac OS. But for now, you're going to have to stick with 2.6. Check it out. It doesn't look so new, though, does it? There's a couple of quick things that I really wanted to show you with regards to the new GIMP. We've got very limited time, so we're going to buzz right through this. Check out some of the things that you can do. First of all, this is a resizable docking plane now. So if you have multiple monitors, you can get this thing to fill your screen. You can now add extra tabs. For example, let's say I want to add a histogram. There it is. Now let's break it out of there and let's add it to there. Now we've got the histogram there, we've got the tool options here, and we can move things around in such a way that we've now got this amazing customizable toolbar that can fill our whole first screen, and then we can do all our image editing on the second screen, for example. Okay, You can see how easy it was for me to do that. Now I'm going to get rid of that tab, I'm going to put my tools back there, I'm going to resize this down. One of the things that people are really excited about, especially if they're moving over from Windows and or even Mac and they're they're using Photoshop on those platforms. Watch what happens if I go right click 
And in here, let's see, I think it's under Windows. Yes, under Windows, single window mode. So for all you Photoshop fans out there, this is going to give you a much more Photoshop-esque And for all you Windows fans out there, I hate to burst your bubble, Robbie, but 2.8 is available for Windows XP, SP3, or later. Did it come out? (laughs) It wasn't there yesterday. (laughs) Thanks, old guy Jim, for giving me a little heads up on that. Well, we beat you by a day. Well, a few days. A few days. You probably didn't even look for Windows (laughs) the other day. I didn't Google it. (laughs) I did. I did. (laughs) He did. Okay. So that's, that's cool. Okay, so now we've got this whole new interface. And again, we've got these dockable kind of areas. You can resize. You can set it up. It's so customizable, so clean. It's using Cairo, so you get uh, smoother rendering on the, on the canvas itself. It's, uh, it's got a uh, better rendering engine. It's using a few different new technologies that are being introduced kind of slowly but surely in order to get toward that 2.10 milestone. So where are you thinking this is in relationship to where Photoshop is for this a lot is, of the features? Now, I see some CMYK features in here right, uh, already, uh, especially the ability to like break apart your CMYK channels. Okay. Um, but it's still a, an RGB system. It's, it's designed for screen. But then I got thinking the other day, you know what? My camera takes RGB photos. I print them. They look fantastic. So you've got to be pretty particular to... I've sent some things to printers where they didn't like my RGB output. It's Yeah, but, it's yeah. quite possible. You know, and some people are still... But it's a different it's a different game. But yeah, definitely it's getting closer. But I think in a lot of ways it wins as well. And we're going to look at that over the next several weeks because there are some things on here that... Uh, on the GIMP that is just so much better. Plain and simple. I've created a canvas here. Here's another new feature because I really want to blast through some of the new features. What happened before when you created a text thing? You got a little pop-up window and you had to enter it in there. Well, now you're actually creating your text on the canvas. Like Photoshop, you can, cr- you can change just an individual portion of the text. You're no longer stuck having to create other text layers in order to change the, the text. And you no longer have to do it in a separate window. You're doing it right there. Sweet. Okay. That's cool. Really cool stuff. Also, lots of new uh, eff- effects, lots of different filters that weren't there before. They're really growing things. They're really tweaking things, optimizing things. They're using GEGL, which is fast and, and s- really smooth anti-aliasing, uh, combined with Cairo as well, of course. Um, and lots of scripts as well. If you go into Effects Foundry, you're going to see a lot of kind of things that are going to allow you to do things really quickly because they've been scripted. So somebody who's really, really good at the stuff has created a script that does all these, you know, this long, long task list in order to make something look a certain way, and they've shared it with you. Apparently you need to enable a GEGL under the view. Yeah, under. yeah. Use GEGL. You can turn that on if you like. What is we, GEGL? We're not going okay, to okay, get into it. It's a is. rendering okay. kind of engine. We're not going to okay. get into it tonight, because uh, then we're getting into technical stuff that probably doesn't matter to a lot of a lot of users. Okay, I'm going to open two images here that I've taken myself, so I have the rights to them, and I share them with you. Notice what happened when I opened two images. I've got two tabs up at the top here. That's another new feature. Okay. One came a spider and sat down beside Zach. Yeah, there you go. All right. So, of course, you're, you're going to want to do stuff to your image that, uh, you know, like I'm going to check my levels on this photo because he's kind of walking in shadows here. So this stuff, this particular thing you know that's not new levels are not new but i'm going to want to touch up the the uh, lighting on that photograph and we're not getting into uh, a photography or editing kind of tutorial tonight i'm just showing you the gimp and we're we can get into that kind of stuff in weeks to come send in your questions live at category5.tv so you see there's some really cool stuff things like being able to convert the photo to look like it was taken with an old lomo camera uh so easily Lomo? just by clicking on Lomo. Yeah, like a, you know, like a pinhole kind of camera, oh, okay. like the old style, you know, really, really old camera that used pinhole style technology, right? So you'll see what's actually happening is somebody's programmed it to do all these layers. So you've got some overexposure in the middle. You've got some vignetting. You've got some black and white layers and some grain. And it's going through and it created that kind of effect which hopefully you can, you can see that on your screen. But there are so many things that are new here in your filters and your effects foundry menu. Uh, are those created as layers? Yes, they're okay. layers, so you can, you can manipulate you can them. them out if you want. Yes. Okay. 
Okay? So what I want to do is I want to encourage you get on to GIMP 2.8 and just experiment. Play with those filters. Uh, the other thing that you need to know is that you're going to export your image once you're done now. You're not file save as. You're going to go file and uh, export the image. And that allows you now to change to you know JPEG, ping, all that kind of stuff. And that's really to help the user so they don't misunderstand what they're doing when they're saving to a JPEG versus an XCF and losing all their layers. Okay, so save as, you could change save as, the name from height to save walk as in the woods. Save as is a master file, your XCF. It contains your layers, your effects, everything. Okay. okay. Layer grouping, I know we're out of time, but layer grouping is a fabulous thing. Watch this. Let's say before I wanted to move this image, and if I had this layer selected, I'm going to really mess things up if I drag it because it it's they're not grouped, okay? What I want to do is I want to add a new layer group by clicking this button right here, okay? And drag my layers into there, and now this group, now I'm doing it backwards, I probably, I think. Did you mess up yeah. the order of them? It, yeah, I did, because I'm out of time. and I, I No, but I mean, that would affect the, uh, <laughs> the image, depending yeah. on what layer you had on top. The layer groups, again, takes okay. us into a much more yeah. professional interface, gives you some features that you're going to love. So check it out. It's GIMP 2.8 from www.gimp.org, available for Linux and Windows. And Windows. And Windows. Yes, we're out of time, folks. Eric, nice having a you here. A good time was had by all. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I wanted to play with that. Oh, yeah? yeah. Great. Have a great <laughs> week, everybody. We'll see it. No. <laughs> <laughs>